Hey strong people, Kale Beck here from startingstrongman.com and I meant to do this video about a week ago. Uh, I think I say that a lot. Pretty busy, life comes up and this has been a crazy time so other things had to take precedence. I hope you're staying safe and your job and life isn't too affected by staying inside or whatever measures you're taking and or have been uh, you've been forced to take. Uh, we can all get through this. Hopefully me making some more videos, which I'm going to be trying to really pump out because I know a lot of people are stuck at home, bored, uh, will help you in some small way. Uh, but this video is my 10,000 subscriber Q&A. Really appreciate you guys helping me get to 10,000. Let's hope 20,000 is sooner um, than that. And I uh, just want to answer some of your questions as a way to say thanks. And maybe... It, I'll go on to uh, talk a little bit about my history on YouTube, but probably there's a lot of I have a lot of questions on here, and I think that's going to take enough time in itself. So, what do you think of the upcoming boxing match between Thor and Eddie Hall? Um, I don't think anything like that's going to happen, even without the coronavirus. How many people has Eddie Hall? so far said he has a upcoming boxing match with we had he was supposed to fight robert oberst like five years ago um it's one of those things that i think they talk about as a fun thing because it gets fans excited and it makes headlines and it keeps people relevant and that's kind of the whole point it's just good exposure whether and it's definitely not happening now because we're not going to have any live events for a bit i don't think I don't think Worlds is going to happen, uh, you know, when it was supposed to. Uh, yeah, pretty much I, I don't I don't see any live sporting events going on for probably most of the rest of the year, is would be my guess. Strength MM asks, what are the first five pieces of equipment you would buy for Strongman apart from a barbell place and rack? So this is a very good question, and especially with uh, a lot of people looking to invest in a home gym because their gyms are shut down or will be shutting down. Don't be surprised if your gym shuts down. Um, and I'm actually doing a write-up, which will be up on startingstrongman.com soon, on how to build a strongman home gym and doing my video series on my own home gym. So uh, I'll quickly, quickly uh, summarize you know, what I think, and that'll go more in depth on those future videos and blog posts. Uh, number one, yoke. You can, this should be your base. You can use it as a squat rack. You can, uh, most of them are able to be used as sleds. You know, you can get the J cups and the spotter arms and use it as a squat rack. That's what I'm doing. My Titan uh, yoke review is coming up. And next, I would say a log. You can't really train log without a log, even though I have a gym on how to train strongman. I have a, a book on how to train strongman in a regular gym. There's certain events that are just too hard to replicate outside of the sport. So we go yoke, log, um, farmer's walk, stones, axle. Uh, or if you don't like, you can get something like the Titan loadable stone, the Bartow stone of steel for one stone, or even sandbags. But the way I say to just do the essentials is what is too, like, what is the most common events you're going to see? And what are the hardest ones, uh, and to train for without them? And you can build your whole foundation of everything around the yoke. It serves a ton of, uh, more purposes and yoke is really hard uh, to train like if you don't train on it it's not an event that anyone just about anyone just gets under and does really good on same with log it's you know you can get strong at pressing and stuff but it's a unique test and you kind of need to train it and same with stones and they're very common events farmers walks of course you're going to see them all the time um you know and from there you know you can get other stuff like you know kegs tires tires you don't see too often anymore sleds etc but yeah, if you're going to buy five pieces of strongman equipment, yoke, log, farmer's walk, stones, axle, and I just throw sandbags in there if you don't want stones because they can kind of be a mess and you you can get pretty good. They're a little bit more versatile to a, than a stone. So that's what I'll say. How should someone increase the speed in moving events like carries, so farmer's walk, etc.? 
the main issue people t uh, do when training for events that are timed, so the fastest time wins, is they train them too damn heavy. You have to look as training it for speed. So what I tell people to do and what I have my clients do is we establish a baseline and we look back at past performances. So if you're competing at a national level and let's say uh, there's a farmer's walk event and it's 50 feet, go look at like the results from last nationals and the winners are probably going to be around eight seconds. It depends on how heavy it is, of course, but generally they're going to be eight. Anything over 10 is not going to be good. So depending on the level of competitor you, you are, I, I try to look at using time domains as a way to train instead of load. So work up, just keep working up until you can no longer complete, you know, work up and wait until you can no longer complete a run in under 10 seconds. Try to do at least, you know, four to five runs doing that. If you can't, you know, then drop down 10% or, and, uh, you know, make it so, you, you know, always time your sets. Another thing you can do is if you have a friend, which a lot of people aren't going to be training together right now, is you can break up everything so you're like if you and you have the the distance you go okay i'm gonna see how far i can take let's say 250 per hand farmer's walks 50 feet in eight seconds right so what you do is you have your friend with a clock and you just go and let's say you have 200 feet of room and he's gonna say time when the clock hits eight seconds then you drop and you're like oh cool i got 60 feet then you do that again in a couple weeks and you go and, and uh you know, you're like, wow, I got 75 feet. That means you're getting faster. You have to throw in a little bit of overload work here and there just to get used uh, to carrying heavier weight. But overall, moving slow with weights teaches you to be slow and moving fast with weights teaches you to be fast. The other recommendation I would make on your actual training, not just your, uh, you know, work, your specific implement work, is to do single leg work like barbell walking lunges, step ups, Bulgarian split squat, squats, etc. Just to make sure that you're, um, you're able to drive evenly off of each leg and your strength is pretty much 50-50. You, know, you don't have a huge imbalance there. Plus it's just good for injury uh, prevention. Um, the other thing I would do is just to do some overall sprint training every now and then and then also do um, agility work like agility drills etc is a is a big help um you can get an agility ladder on amazon.com slash shop slash starting strongman for like 20 bucks that comes with a list of like little ladder drills and stuff to do and it's pretty beneficial especially if you have limited access to a gym right now during uh quarantine time i guess you would call it um it's something you can just set up in your yard and there's a good opportunity to get better at things you normally wouldn't have time to do um so yeah uh Train events for, for speed by being fast, by not worrying about how much weight you're using. So like, let's say week one, work with a weight fastest you can do in 10 seconds. Week two, furthest you can go within a set amount of time. And then like week three, you can do a heavier overload set where it's closer to contest weight or above contest weight, depending on how strong you are for uh, minimal sets just to get that heavy set. But I'd say at least 75% of your training for moving events, if not closer to 80 to 90, should be with you moving them fast, not just slugging along. I was super slow with yoke because I was, it was, the weights in contests were always so much higher than I could do that I would just plod along and I got, I got really good, really good is probably a stretch, um, at like doing a super heavy yoke. But then when I dropped down, when they made the 175 class and it had its own weights, then it, it dropped from having to do like an 800 pound yoke to a 600. Even though I can maybe do an 800 pound yoke better than some of the other competitors, I was so slow with 600 because I had always trained to do the events slow. Make sense? So do the events fast and you'll get faster. And you have to track how far you can carry weights in certain time domains and uh, how fast you can do uh, certain distances with certain weights and use those sets as PRs more than like, oh, I can do 280 pounds for 50 feet as your farmer's walk PR. But like, I can do 240 in, you know, 8.2 seconds is my best time. And then you try to beat that. And try to do more overall runs in that same thing. Once your performance drops by 10%, you stop. Kind of like sprint training, as far as I understand.
sprinters train at least. How to do long medleys without getting gassed. It feels like I have the strength, but I run out of breath. Uh, you need to do more general conditioning work. Do walks, do steady state cardio, do a little bit of interval training, train more medleys. If you have a medley where everything is 50 feet, drop, do 60 to 70% of the contest weight and do everything for 150 feet. It'll kill you, but you'll be better. You just have to do it and you have to do more general cardio. Um, you have to be in more, you know, just general, better overall shape. And they always are going to suck. It's, you know, you have to have the strength endurance as well. And uh, if you, like right now, if you have limited access to equipment, it's a really good time to do a 20 rep squat program. I would highly recommend that if you just have a simple barbell and not much else. It, I think that prepares you for a, a lot of medleys and strongman events because doing 20 rep squats sucks. Weekly strongman podcast about athletes, the sport itself, strongman news like usually do, interviews with athletes, training talks, crossover sports, etc. Um, I was the host of one of the first strongman podcasts ever. Uh, it was called um, American Strongman Radio. I did that for Strongman Corporation for a year. Then I started my own podcast called, called Strong Talk Podcast. I did it with Robert Oberst for about a year. Then I did it with uh, Mike Badalino for about the same amount of time. Then I had a kid and my time got really short. It was harder to schedule um, guests and co-hosts. And it's been about two years since I've done many one-on-one -on -one interviews podcast style. And that's why I started doing the videos like this, where it's just me talking because I can do this anytime I want. Yes, I will bring, if you search Strong Talk Podcast on wherever you listen to podcasts, there's hundreds of them. The newer one, up to 50 is about when I did it with Robert Obers, and that was a very different format. Then after that, once it says the athlete next to it, um, I interviewed Zadruna Savickas, Jerry Pritchett, tons of uh, top pros uh, and, you know, uh, new pros and stuff. And there's some good conversations on there, so I, I suggest you check it out. And, uh, well, you're uh, self-isolating uh, right now. Um, but, yeah, I've done it, and I plan to do it again once I get time and it makes more sense, but it's once I started doing it in this format, I got so many more views and it's so much less work. It kind of is like, why would I schedule a guest if a, way less people are going to watch it? Which type of sandbag and what kind of weight would you recommend a beginner to get? You can go to store.startingstrongman.com and we have a couple of different types of so we have a couple of different types of sandbags there. I would recommend the Cerberus Strength Dual Ply. They're one where you have to get certain weights, and it depends on your strength level. I would say a 150 and a 200 pound bag would be a good range for most guys. Um, you can do a lot with the 150, including conditioning work, and the 200 is going to, you know, if you're doing like novice or beginner level contests, you're probably not going to see much over like 250. And if you train more volume on a 200, it'll be applicable um, to do it. Yeah, and, and uh, you can use code CERBERUSSS there to get 10% off your order. Store.startingstrongman.com, Cerberus Strength Bags. What are your three favorite strongmen in history? Also, congrats for the 10,000 subscriptions. So this is hard. If we look, like, what do you say by history? Like, I have personal friends that are my favorite strongman. Um, and what I like to do is I like to go back and I like to look at it a little bit more objectively and on how, like, who inspired me as I was starting and who I think really revolutionized different parts of the sport. And going by that, my three favorite would be Yoko Hola, Derek Poundstone, and Zadruna Savickas. Uh, uh, Savickas, because I just believe he's the strongest uh, man that ever lived. And he really brought, in my opinion, he's the first person who like had that elite, elite, could be as strong as anyone in the world statically into strongman, but was still good enough at traditional strongman events. And he really, he really changed everything. He made it a lot heavier um, because of that. And he's why we got the athletes after him that were also statically strong and adequate and good at um, moving events. You know, and, and like people like Thor had to get like, if there was no Zadruna Savickas pushing the envelope on like what people could do, you know, 
I don't think Brian Shaw would have got as statically strong and trained the way he did. I don't think Hathor Bjornsson would have got that. They would have stayed how you saw a lot of 2000 strongmen where, you know, like taller guys like that, um, where they were pretty strong, but they they were more athletic and we wouldn't have got seen the static strength develop that much because usually there was guys like Z who are statically strong, but then they just get crushed in the moving events. And Z would surprise you and move a, and uh, win a couple of them. And he just made the sport advance where you had to be both. And it's really hard to find that mix. So I'd say him for that reason. Yoko Ahola, because he, he, as far as I know, was the first strongman to really look at the sport and not like, oh, I'm just, I'm just going to get strong and show up and do it. He, he made his own implements. Um, his DVD, I, I watched when I was starting and I thought it was so cool. Um, you know, he was a, a smaller guy. I think the smallest guy to ever win World's Strongest Man, but he was still had a great deadlift and he treated like how to get better on the events. He trained them more and that revolutionized the sport. He's like, oh, Oh, to get better at farmer's walks, um, I'm going to train more farmer's walks. Wow. I know, it sounds novel today. You know, it, it seems, you know, looking back, it seems obvious, but at the time, I don't think it was. And Derek Poundstone, just because he was huge in the sport when I was first getting into it, I mean, he had, uh, you know, he, he was a great spokesman for the sport. He's kind of stepped out of the um, public a little bit more. You know, he's still there, you know, on... He's still on Instagram and stuff, but you don't see a ton of stuff about him. But back then when I was starting, he he was the only strongman you really saw, like, pushing. He was on major media. He had major sponsors. He was cross-training with, you know, bodybuilders and growing the sport and introducing it to more different uh, people in the strength culture. And I don't think he gets enough credit for that. Um, you know, we see a lot of people doing that now on YouTube and et cetera, and it's pretty normal and strongman's huge, but he kind of was a little bit of ahead of his time, unfortunately. I got, he, he was super popular and still is, but if he was doing it today, how like YouTube, it, um, strongman is on YouTube now, Derek would be huge. Like he had the physique, he was, he was strong, he, you know, he, he could talk pretty well. He's super smart about the sport. And, you know, that's why he's, you know, one of my favorites. Your top five strongman events. Also, a big one here, what do you see in the future of the sport, and what would you like to see if it's different? Congrats on 10,000. Um, top five events. I like I like three-part medleys. I like Atlas Stones. When I say three-part medleys, it's just like, you know, you do a sandbag carry and do like a tire flip and do a backwards drag. Um, you know, truck pulls, it's just cool looking. Log press with a real wooden log, I think is just visually stunning. Uh, car deadlift, uh, stones. You just need those quintessential events that don't use plate weights. That's what I think Strongman is. It's just like you look at something and it just doesn't seem like movable. It, it's something the average person who doesn't even go to the gym can look at and they appreciate it. And that's what I like to see. On the future of the sport... Whew, uh, this was a very different question a week ago when you asked it. Um, I think it's going to be a, now, with every event being canceled, I think this is going to be a very hard time. Strongman was just hitting its stride as far as, uh, you know, getting, you know, mainstream popular. People are going to shows, and uh, Strongman really got tanked. It was kind of on the same rise until the recession in 2008. And I kind of feel like it built up all that momentum and it's really going to crash and it's going to be hard for um, especially promoters like Giants Live, etc. that can't promote shows for who knows how long or even just having to rebook the ones they do. They have no cash coming in until whatever. Um, so then, you know, sponsors are going to go away for athletes and events if their businesses can't, um, you know, they, they're going to have to cut funding. And the first thing to do is like sponsoring strongman shows and we... I already saw this happen, you know, 12 years ago, and I just hope that there's, you know, we're more connected as a community now, and we can all support each other and find different ways, like, you know, going to officialstrongman.com and, like, the the content they put up there to support big promoters, you know, the athletes still being able to make YouTube videos, even if they can't go to contests and train to stay relevant and, uh, you know, get eyeballs on and get keep their sponsors happy. But I think we're in for a rocky road um, as far as the sports strongman goes. Not trying to be too doom and gloom, but it's just how I feel. 
How many World Strongest Man titles do you think Marius Pujanowski would have won if the IFSA split never happened? So a little background, if you don't know, um, in, what was it, 2004 or 5, there ended up being two strongman federations, and it was called IFSA, International Federa Federation Strongman Athletes, something like that. And it was, I don't have it all in front of me, so it's hard to say, but it was a lot of the same people who ran World Strongest Man kind of offshoot and made their own thing, and they brought a lot of the athletes with them. So the, the World Strongest Man before that, um, Marius Pujanowski actually got third. Vasyl Verstuk, Verstuk of uh, Ukraine won, and Zajur Sivikas was second. Um, then there was, what, three, four years there where, um, you know, the athletes were kind of split. They competed in one or the other. A lot of the athletes actually, from what I understand, got paid an annual salary to only compete in those events. So it was very good for a couple of the athletes. Um, so I think, what did Marius... How many had he won at that point? Two or three? I think he would have lost. He would have ended up... I think he had two before that. And once IFSA happened, he pretty much won every year during IFSA because it was split. I think he still would have won three or four. I think Zadrunas or Vasil would have stole at least one, if not two, from him. But I think people downplay Marius Pujanowski too much and he's a great athlete and he you could see when he came back he still won when some of the ISA people came over like Derek Poundstone very close but he it got a little bit heavier and he adapted he was he, he you know the, the events were were lighter and you know he was better at him because he was so fast but Marius would adapt he'd have like he was bad at the fingle fingers then he went and trained on him and killed everyone the next year and that's what great athletes do. So I don't think it's as big of a factor as people take. But it, yeah, I, I think he would have, you know, it would have been more competitive. So he would have had one or two less um, than 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 five. Tips for your first contest. So the number one thing is to, you know, just get it out of the way. Go show up. My first contest, I zeroed four out of five events, and I loved it, and I learned so much by doing it. I didn't wait till I was ready. Uh, some tips, talk to everyone, talk to the promoter, talk to the judges, ask them questions, tell them about yourself, tell them where you live, talk to your other competitors, to ask them how they train, network there. It's a great opportunity and that's really what you're going to get the most out of at your first contest is meeting other people in the sport and you might find someone else who has a garage gym or something to go train at. Um, also talk to the judges, make sure you, you just listen. You're, if you're competing uh, around people and you're, you're waiting for someone to give you a down com command instead of you've just been training at the, g the gym yourself um, and lifting on your own time, sometimes you know, I see a lot of first-time competitors, they press a log or something, they don't wait for that down command, and I've judged a lot of contests, and I can't give them that rep. I want to give you that rep, but if you don't listen to the rules and you don't listen to me, the ju judge's command, I can't give it to you. It's different than lifting in a gym, doing it on your own time. I'm telling you when it's good and not, not you. Um, and just, you know, uh, bring, don't change anything at the contest. If you, you like, you find some pre-workout or you're like, oh, these are my new elbow sleeves or, oh, I'm going to use this tacky. You should have already been practicing that in training. Don't try any different shoes, supplements, food, do everything just like it you've been doing in training, um, but just you know you're gonna don't want to throw unknown variables into the sport. What to find out what shoes or you know elbow sleeves or whatever work best? That's for when you do it in practice, not the contest. And pra training is practice. And you know make sure to bring plenty of fluids. Bring salt tabs, noon tablets. Um, quick, easy food to eat, uh, shade if it's in the sun, sunscreen, and try to, like, you should cheer for everyone else, but don't get over amped up that you're, you're, uh, losing your energy and your adrenaline. It, it can really take a lot out of you cheering for everyone. I'm not saying not to cheer for everyone, but those big adrenaline spikes and dumps is going to take more out of you for your own contest. And most of all, just make sure to have fun. You know, it, it's, it's just to get it out of the way. 
see how much you like the sport and you learn a lot from your first contest. You shouldn't go, go in expecting like, oh, I'm going to go in and win. Some people do, but it's not the point. You know, if, if you don't, don't do novice, if you can do any of the weights in the open, strongman should be about challenging yourself. Um, so that's the point of this. It's going to, you're going to, you're going to suck on some stuff, but that's the point because then you go and you have an idea of what you need to train next and what you need to do differently and you learn. And that's what this whole sport, in my opinion, is about self betterment and seeing what you are possibly capable of. It's not about winning trophies. That's a byproduct of showing what you're capable of. It's not the point. So make, make you know, talk to everyone, network, have fun. Don't, don't change anything and uh, make sure you learn. I think Brian Shaw will make a huge comeback for World's Strongest Man. Um, it's hard to say. I think he's, what, almost 40 now? He's a little slow. He used to win. You know, he's slower, and he's been losing events because of that. And, you know, with his hamstring injury, his deadlift isn't up to snuff to a lot of the competitors, too, which used to be a strong suit. I don't think Brian Shaw has gotten much worse in the past couple of years. I think everyone else has gotten better so there's just more competition i think i said this in my last q a as well but i'll just repeat it since the question was asked i think brian shaw is still a top you know five competitor at any any show he does possibly but where he falls in that one to five is up to him i i can't say it um would i pick him to win world's strongest man i i think that would be a long shot is it possible Depends on the events and how he shows up and how everyone else does. I don't think anyone, or not many, would have picked Martins because Thor looked unbeatable. But Thor just looked a little too beat up going into Worlds, had that foot injury. And Martins looked better than he ever has. So he's right person, right time. And that's, that's sports. That's why sports are so great. You can't predict what's going to happen. Um, him not training, you, know, you know, he says he's focusing on just World's Strongest Man. And that's his only focus. He doesn't care as much about the Arnolds, etc. But he tried to, he did a Arnold qualifier. He tried to do it. Um, but now with less people, less contests, and I, I assume Worlds is going to be pushed back, I don't think he's going to have the same advantage a lot of people thought he ha would have um, by, you know, be, being more well-rested and trained specifically for this one contest. But, you know, I'd say he, you know, he'll, he'll fall somewhere in the top five might be third. I, I don't think anyone is, if you had to pick favorites, half is the clear favorite. Of course, it always depends on the events. Let's just assume World's Strongest Man is going to happen when they say it. It was when I'm making this. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I think it would be a long shot for him to win his fifth title, but that's not up for me to say. That's up for him. But, you know, if I was going to put my money on it, I'd put my money on Half Thor or uh, Kieliszkowski at this point, and and Lisi's. And there's a couple other people like Tom Stoltman, etc. Depending on the events, I always say that, but it's really important in this sport. They could be in there, but I think he could make a podium. It wouldn't make the podium. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but if he won this fifth title, it would be one of the biggest comebacks in strongman history. And I, you know, I. But there's. No, no reason to say he wouldn't. I just, I wouldn't put my money on it. Movement to drive lower body progress and upper body progress. If we're talking specifically about strongman, I will pick um, the deadlift and log press. Uh, I think log press carries over to, you know, all of the other uh, pressing events better than other ones carry over to the other ones like you know uh, so if i'm going to pick one to use in the off season it's log press and deadlift is the most common event in strongman you're going to see so i think it's going to you know your most common lower body movement at least so you should deadlift a lot um, if i was to pick two movements to do you know just for overall strength i would pick front squat and log press, uh, I, that's kind of the stuff I train, and I, I think they have a great carryover. Am I going to be at USS Nationals? No. Why don't I compete anymore? Um, I competed for about 10 years. I made the Arnold twice, the Arnold World Championships for the lightweight class. That's the highest level you can compete in the sport, at least at that time. There's no pro class for lightweight strongman. And I started to get good in like 2011-12. And, you know, I won a couple contests, go to nationals, you're, you know, in the running, top five, ten, 
etc and it's really competitive once you get to that level and I, I you know I don't have the biggest base or best like I'm not a great athlete to get there and I just got so stuck in having I can't miss a nationals can't miss an Arnold and just just limping through stuff that it really caught up with me at my last Arnold in 2014 I wasn't healthy anymore I had high blood pressure I had so many injuries, I was just in so much pain doing certain events that I just it just all hit a wall and I did horrible at the Arnold in 2014. And I went, okay, and I didn't plan I planned on competing after that, and I have. Um but that was also right then because of competing in the sport, I lost my job and I really had to put all of my focus into starting strongman. And I couldn't be as selfish by just taking that time to train, I had to put that into my business to make sure I could, you know, provide resources like this for you guys and to make sure that I could pay my bills. So I said, okay, I'm gonna take a step back from the sport and I dabble and I try to get in and I try to say, train the same way I did um, before and I just keep getting hurt. I just put so much, it just, it wasn't working anymore and it took me a couple of years. That was weird. Um, it took me a couple years, and I think I'm just now at it where I can put all of my past ego aside, my past numbers aside, and train how I have to train now as a beat up um, old strongman in his mid 30s instead of trying to compete like uh, and train like a young 20 year old who has no care in the world. You know, it's a lot different. Once I had a wife, um, that cared about me, now my son. I want my training to help the rest of my life. I don't want to just have constant back pain where it's like, oh, if I go to pick up my son, I hurt. Um, oh, I don't want to walk up this hill because my knee hurts. I want, I train for fun to try to stay healthy um, because I enjoy it. And I kind of refound what I like about training. And, and at some point, competing was taking more away from me than it was given. It's not like there's any prize money or anything like that in amateur strongman or lightweight strongman, which I compete in. I'm not, you know, I, I am no half Thor, Brian Shaw, etc. That's just I'm I'm five seven. What, what are you gonna do? Um, I I really think I pushed my body and myself to its absolute limit, and I'm happy of what I've accomplished. There's of course there's more I would have liked to accomplish, um, but it it a lot of it made me the person I am today. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, the the two contests I did since the Arnold in 2014. I did a contest at Untamed Strength, um, and I was like, "Oh, I'll just go do this one for fun." I was feeling a little stronger, not too beat up, still had a couple issues, and I tore my bicep on the first event, and that kind of was like because I got too competitive. I went 20 pounds over what I was planning to hit to be conservative. Like I'll just go into the show, not completely push myself. And just have fun. I hear other people do that. They don't just go crazy and absolutely try to kill each event and kill themselves. They just have fun at contest. And that showed me that's not fun for me. The thing I, I found fun from Strongman was pushing it to that point and not breaking or and not caring. And now I cared. My life changed and I cared if I got hurt or if I hurt or other people cared about me. And when I was in my mid-20s, I honestly didn't. And it just, I realized that's not for me. I did another team contest, and that one I actually took a little more lax because, you know, there's three of us. Uh, so I didn't feel as much pressure on myself. Um, then I had my kid, and I just don't have time right now. It's uh, I barely have time to make this video. So that's why, um, you know, I'd compete again if I felt healthy enough, and it seemed like it would give me fun. Um, but I've made some commitments to myself. I won't do that. I won't compete again unless I'm healthy. And that means my blood pressure is in check. Uh, I have no like nagging injuries, like my back doesn't hurt after I deadlift, etc. cetera. Uh, so right now I just train um, to have fun and uh, you know try to not look like complete shit and not get too fat and uh, be healthier. So I, you know, I do a lot more cardio, do a lot more bodybuilding stuff. And I, I kind of refound again what I love so much about um, training, which led me to Strongman, because Strongman was just, I think, the peak of, like, it's like, you know, you look at all the different kind of sports, 
and test the ways you can test your body through strength training and strongman is the number one. I don't care what anyone says. I will argue that all day. So that's what I wanted to do. And now I just refound what I like. I like doing a lot of bodybuilding style stuff mixed with a few strongman events. And that's kind of how I train now. And I, I look at an event and I know what it would take for me to get back to that level. And it's just, it's more work than I have time for. And I'm honest with that. And it's just, I'd rather um, just be a little bit more overall general around fit instead of just have to be good at these five events.